Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another episode of Great People TV every Wednesday or Thursday with me Ben Ibrahim and Hannah Ismail and speaking of which welcome back Hannah Ismail how are you? Assalamu alaikum I'm good as ever but right now I'm still on home quarantine tapi kepada anda semua jangan lupa untuk terus ikuti kami di Great People TV jangan lupa untuk subscribe kami di Facebook dan juga follow kami di Facebook kami Great People TV dan follow Ben di Instagram di Facebook Ben Ibrahim dan juga saya Hana Ismail di Instagram Hana Al Mauza dan juga Hana Ismail di Facebook okey Well no I I'll... Didn't even have a chance to ask you about your trip, <laughs> Oprah, and then you're just straight into work mode. I really appreciate that about you. But how was the Holy Land of Umrah? Oh, uh, mashallah, it's great. Uh, tak ramai orang, uh, tapi bagaimanapun uh, kepada anda semua, kalau anda plan untuk bercuti ke luar negara, jangan lupa untuk sentiasa pastikan anda menjaga SOP anda, walau di mana sahaja anda berada. Itu yang paling penting sekali, Ben. That's right. Look after yourself, indeed. But speaking of looking after yourself. We just want to start our show by, as usual, thanking our sponsor at your answer for supporting us and being our sponsor for a wonderful channel, Great People TV, for you know, giving us a lot of our support. And yeah, we really, really appreciate them. And don't forget, at the end later, we'll be giving away some prizes from your answer. So stick around and stand a chance to win the at your answer ISO 4 in 1 multifunctional blood glucose filter. Isn't that right now? Betul. Untuk anda semua jangan lupa dan jangan ketinggalan untuk memenangi hadiah menarik daripada sponsor kami di IQ Answer. Jadi pastikan anda kekal ke akhir rancangan ini untuk anda layak mendapatkan hadiah yang menarik berupa uh, barangan daripada IQ Answer. Okay? That's right. So please participate and you can stand a chance to win a prize. So stay with us right yeah. throughout the show. It's very, very simple. Momentai as they say in many many languages but look today we are speaking about the language of health we have the president of the national cancer Center of malaysia on our screen right now perfect timing right there that's dr sandari soma syndrome aka dr sound if you forget her name you can't forget her name because it's dr sound just remember the sound that comes out of our ears because when she speaks the whole world listens Dr. Sound, welcome to Great People TV, and how are you? I'm fine, Ben. It's lovely to be here. Hi, Hannah. Hi, yes. Dr. Sound. Nice meeting you. Okay, Doctor. Sebenarnya untuk pengetahuan semua, hari ini topik kita sangat-sangat menarik. Kekal sihat untuk cegah kanser. Stay healthy to prevent cancer, Ben. That's right. And let's just get stuck into it, Hannah, as I always like to say. But, Dr. Sound, I'm sorry. I'm going to start with a very complicated question, but... Nothing that you don't know, but before, I'm just kidding, but before you, before we talk about this topic today, how did you get into medicine? You know, because you're a doctor and you're the president. Usually when people see a president of a big association or society, a CEO, they expect a finance person, an ex-banker, but we see a doctor, a doctor walking the talk, you know, walking the talk. So before we talk about the NCSM journey and how NCSM is trying to do great things to prevent cancer, Tell us about how you got into this very wonderful but demanding career called medicine. That's quite funny, Ben. Um, <laughs> I did medicine um, primarily because, you know, I didn't get into the one which I wanted to get into, which is vet, vet science. Um, and so medicine was the second choice in that sense. But having said that, I decided to quit medicine after 20 years of, of, of doing medicine because, you know, for me, it was just frustrating. And, and then I went and did an MBA, which then, you know, brings in that that whole economic aspect of it. Um, but it was, I think the best thing I did was to quit hospital medicine and move into public health. Because the frustrating aspect of um, treating people was that seeing the stage in which people were coming, when you knew that so many things were actually preventable and if we could have found it at earlier stages or we could have done something, something a bit earlier, the outcomes would have been so much better. And that was the frustrating aspect about hospital medicine. So yeah, um, going to public health, um, which was something I never expected when I started medicine, um, I think was was my best move. And that's how I landed up in the National Cancer Society of Malaysia. Right, right. And, you're, and you've, you've done that role for a long time and you still fight, you know, fight the good fight because it is a, it is a very, uh, let's just say, tough job. It's not an easy job and 
uh, I mean, the whole world, not just Malaysia, expects the world out of yeah. But we'll get back, we'll get to that a little bit later. But I mean, I want to spend, we want to spend this next hour not frightening people about cancer. We want to build the awareness about, look, it's out there, whether you like it or not. Okay, and if you yep. don't look after yourself, it will come after you. And it's nasty, it's unforgiving, and it has no emotion. Okay, it's not a human being. It's, you know, something that can cause a you know, disease that causes a lot of problems and death eventually, if not, if, not, if not treated properly. So maybe you can tell us, break it down for us in terms of just in a very simplistic coffee shop conversation way. It doesn't have to be done in a very medical okay. way or technical way, but, you know, who, who, which age groups is it more, most affecting? Gender, the causes, you know, all the above. And then later, we can get to the because we're talking about the what now later we can get to the how okay so basically when you know when you talk about cancer globally um everybody knows heart disease and everybody thinks you know heart disease is the number one disease in the whole world when it comes to what we call non-communicable diseases so nothing to do with infections like covid um so these are what we call non-communicable diseases which heart disease cancer diabetes etc are in and around the world, um, heart disease might be considered the number one, but unfortunately, cancer is overtaking it. And so in some countries, cancer is number one. And in Malaysia, in the next decade or so, cancer will become the number one cause of um, disease, as well as cause of death in the country. Um, so at the moment, if you look at it, we have about 45,000 Malaysians developing cancer every year. That's 45,000. Um, if you break it down to men and female, men actually um, have less risk of cancer than women at the moment. So for men, we are looking at about one in 10 men in their lifetime. So by the age of 75, one in 10 men will develop cancer. While in women, it is about one in eight who will develop cancer. Okay. Um, when you break it down in terms of ages, women tend to get cancer at younger ages. Men tend to get cancer at older ages. So for women, the most cancers you get are below the age of 60. For men, it's over the age of 60. And that's primarily because of two cancers, which is breast cancer and cervical cancer. So breast cancer is the number one cancer in Malaysia, irrespective of men or women. Okay, it's 18% it's, um, of all cancers in the country. It's 38% of all women's cancers. Um, cervical cancer is, I think, about number five, but it's still quite, a, you know, you're talking about 4,000 women plus who are developing cervical cancer as well um, every year. So those are the main cancers that we see in women. In men, the main cancers that you see are colorectal cancers, cancers of the colorectal. We're talking about the large bowel cancer and lung cancer. Um, and, you know, when, when we used to talk about male and cancer, you always thought of lung cancer and because of tobacco. And tobacco, yes, is still there as the number one cause of cancer. 20% of all cases of cancer are, are linked to, to smoking. However, colorectal cancer is the silent cancer which has been increasing and it has become the number one cancer in men and it's actually the number two cancer in women and it's a cancer that we don't talk about a lot however it is nearly a hundred percent preventable um, and that's a word you know prevention which is not really associated with cancer yes um, but it should be associated with cancer and i hope that you know that's something Thing that we can talk a little bit about here in terms of the prevention um, of cancer in that aspect. Definitely, I mean, and I mean, I think that's a question that Hannah is very, very eager to to ask you. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've opened it up, and it's really funny that I just want to tell a little bit of a joke before we move on with uh, Hannah's going to ask because it's really funny that you said you want to study vet veterinary medicine uh, at the start, that you're going to study veterinary medicine, and as you were talking about the stats. The dogs were barking, and there was, I think yes. they were going to say, "I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree." <laughs> but you know what they say: animals are people's best friend. So the, the yep. not just the humans that 
you know, that are affected. Hey, the animal kingdom has spoken as well, so that we're backed up by that today. Nah? <laughs> Ya, yeah, sebenarnya uh, Ben dan Dr. Sal, eh, bila Dr. Sal bagi tahu tentang statistik kebarangkalian untuk wanita dan juga lelaki uh, dapat penyakit kanser ini sebagai satu benda yang agak alarming bagi saya because one of my cousin actually died from cancer, uh, from cervical cancer uh, to be exact uh, and we lost her two years ago and uh, it was quite sudden and it's not like it, she told everyone that she had cancer and suddenly it's already in stage four. So which comes back to my question, uh, why is it that a lot of people, even though it's 2021, we are seeing they're so afraid of going to the doctor and and seek for medical checkups, you know, for uh, untuk rawatan, uh, because why, why are they so afraid? Why are they so afraid, doctor? I think um, the unfortunate part, if you, if you look at uh, if you look at it that way, and I'm so sorry, my dogs are going here. Hey, <laughs> That's part of the show. This is why Great People TV Which is, the, is the best in the, in the world. We don't discriminate. Um, I, I think you know when you when you talk about heart disease, um, people are more likely to go and check up about heart disease um, because there isn't so much of a stigma associated with heart disease. There's a stigma associated with cancer, and that stigma, it, it, we're not sure why it's there still. You know, those days it was thought that cancer is something which is inherited. Um, so if you come from a line of people who have cancer, that you know it's something within your blood or something within your body, and you can you can infect someone because you have cancer. Um, but that thinking has already changed. However, that stigma which is associated with cancer is still there. And I think that stigma is also associated with that idea of death. People think of cancer, you think of death. But if you look at countries like Australia, you look at countries like the States or even in the UK, 80% plus of people survive cancer. So more people are living with cancer than people are dying of cancer. And actually, you know, survival rates with cancer in some countries are better than survival rates with heart disease. Um, but those are the type of statistics or those are the type of information which Malaysians don't actually um, get. And, and unfortunately, that's also because health literacy in Malaysia is very, very low. You know, I think um, when we talk about health literacy in Malaysia, we're talking about 3.8%. Um, in terms of health literacy. People, yes, have heard of cancer. They've heard of, you know, um, maybe that you have to go and do a mammogram or you have to go and do a pap smear, etc. But they don't think it applies to them. So there's little bits of information, but people don't actually personalize that information and make it their own. And, and that is the issue that we're having, I think, in Malaysia. So, yeah, doctor, that being said, uh, what is actually NCSM role in order to create awareness and to educate people out there um, of uh, the importance of staying healthy to prevent cancer? What are the measures that we can uh, can do to prevent cancer? Um, Anna, you know, that's a wonderful question, not just for you know, NCSM in that sense, because yes, NCSM can be there to help you in terms of the health promotion to give you the information so that, um, you know, the internet is a wonderful place, but it's also a difficult place to navigate because you've got so much information and you actually don't know what is right, what is wrong, what is, um, as I said, you know, personalized or individualized to you, you know, what is accurate for you. Um, so that's what we can do in NCSM. Um, mm -hmm. We have amazing amount of information um, that, on cancers. We do a lot of community uh, programs to elevate um, cancer awareness. Um, but I think the main thing is that people have to be proactive. You know, we can't wait till something is wrong until we decide to do something or, you know, go to the hospital or seek treatment. Cancer takes a long time to happen. It takes, you know, 10 to 15 years for it to mature and actually become cancer. So before we get cancer, we've got 10 or 15 years to be proactive, to look at our health and think, okay, you know, what can I do now 
to stop myself from getting cancer when I'm 40 years old or 50 years old or 60 years old, et cetera, et cetera. So really cancer education um, is not for people my age, to be honest. Cancer education in terms of prevention are for our youngsters, are for our children, you know, our young adults. That's when they have to be proactive. That's when they need to, the information um, on cancer. And it's just not cancer. Um, as, I'm, as, as you know, we, we talked about a little bit earlier on, is that we're not asking you to do anything majorly different in terms of staying healthy to stop yourself from getting cancer. We're asking you to do exactly what everyone is telling you in terms of heart disease or diabetes or high cholesterol, all those things. Um, all those things have the same, share the same risk factors when it comes to cancer. You know, and, and those are the risk factors that we all have to focus on to prevent cancer. Right, right. And uh, Dr. Sam, maybe uh, on that, on just writing off Hannah's question, which is a great question, maybe you can tell, I mean, I, we, we know what NCSM does, and, but tell the viewers out there about the work that NCSM does. I mean, I'll speak about the wins in a minute. But I'll just speak yep. more about, ask about the more operational aspects. So let's just say, let's paint a hypothetical situation, which you know the movie very, very well, which you see almost every day. You know, someone, unfortunately, whether it's a male or a female, like you said, females younger, go to the hospital, they find out they have cancer and everything, and all the, they go through all the medical protocols, what needs to be done, chemotherapy, treatment, what should you should tell your family, what shouldn't. What's NCSM's role? I mean, when the, okay. patient, when the patient comes to you, I mean, are they seeking like a second opinion? Are they seeking counseling? Are they seeking information? Tell our viewers out there how NCSM really helps. Okay. So we have three arms in, in NCSM. One we call our educate, and educate is more that health promotion aspect of it. But it's also educate in terms of people who have cancer is to empower them with information. Um, that they need to know so that they can actually make decisions on what their cancer journey should be like for them. Um, doctors, you know, doctors are very set in their way that if you get a certain cancer and there's, there's certain factors associated with that cancer, this is the treatment that you have to do. Um, but what we try to push is that idea of holistically looking at the cancer so when we say holistically looking at the cancer it means that yes you know cancer treatment should be planned to take in account to your whole life not just the cancer itself so when someone has cancer um we we tell you to actually come and contact us you know we have a helpline um number which is one 800 1000 you know call us and we can support you through that journey. So if you know, you've seen the doctor, you've spent 20 minutes, half an hour with that doctor, and then that, that doctor sends you off and you've got the sheaf of information, um, a lot of gibberish in your mind because all you heard was you have cancer. Um, and you don't hear anything else after that other than the doctor saying, oh, you have to be treated. Um, and you've got this sheaf of papers which have a lot of medical terms on it telling you what sort of cancer you have and you don't really know what what's the next step so we are the next step call us um, and what we can do for you is that we can go through that sheet of paper with you you know we can go through your results with you we can explain the results to you we can explain the results in a way so you can understand why the doctor has said that you should have this treatment and not a different treatment because one of the things um, which happens to, to cancer patients or people with cancer and their families is that once they've been diagnosed and people get to know about it, there's this overload of information. People will say, oh, yes, you know, um, that person had, your, had the same cancer and they were treated this way. Mm -hmm. But then your doctor has given you a different treatment plan. And then you sit there and you question, is my doctor treating me properly? You know, mm -hmm. um, is, is there, is he treating me because, and this is the most common thing, you know, treating me because he wants to make more money. Um, and so he's giving me different drugs, you know, so all these 
things go in, in, in your mind, um, not realizing that, you know, there's, there's nuances to cancer. That just because you say you have breast cancer doesn't mean that every cancer is the same. Um, so yeah. we are there to actually break it down for you. So you understand why the doctor has um, prescribed a certain medicine or prescribed a certain pathway or journey in terms of the cancer um, treatment that you're supposed to have. Um, we take also into account what is important to you, you know, what you're worried about, um, what you hope to achieve in terms of your treatment outcomes. Because yes, even though everybody wants to be cured of the cancer, not everyone can depending on the stage that they've come. If they come at early stages, then yes, you know, it's much easier to cure. But if you come at later stages, cure might not be an option for you. It could be that, you know, how do we prolong your life while you live with cancer? So, you know, all this is individualized to the person. Um, and so we can guide you through things like that and um, give you questions for you to ask your doctor. So we don't take the place of your doctor, you know, we don't make the decisions for you or the doctor in terms of, okay, this is the treatment you should have. But we try to empower you so that you have a voice in your treatment plan. You have a voice um, in your journey with cancer. And alongside that as well is that we've got hundreds of, of um, survivors who have gone through the same journey you know, similar journeys as, as you might be going through, and they're there to help you. They're there to hold your hand, you know, to talk about it. And we all know that, you know, if we can share our journeys, the burden feels a little bit less. You don't feel as if you're falling into this whole, you know, sinkhole. You feel as if there's a net there which is going to stop you from falling. And, and that's what I'd like to say about the National Cancer Society is that we are that net to stop you from falling into this in, into this dark pit. Um, so that's what we do. <laughs> so, I mean, just one more question before I bounce back to Hannah. The, especially in, in, in a time where mental health is very much part of the conversation, uh, people are more open to admitting that they have a challenge or a problem on their plate. I suppose that's where the survivors come in and act as real counselors, don't they? I've been through it. I've gone through it, it's hell, but we'll go through it with you, correct? Exactly, exactly that. Um, a lot of people don't want to talk about their cancers to their own family members um, because they don't know how to describe what they're feeling. They don't think that the people around them will understand, and it, which is true enough because a lot of time the people around them are very much focused in terms of the physical and the treatment options of the cancer. They don't actually look at the emotional aspects of it. And you know, then that was me with my mother. When my mother got cancer as a doctor, all I could think about was, okay, we had to do A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, to get rid of the cancer. But I never really sat down and talked to her and asked her how she was feeling, you know, what, what, was, what was important to her um, what was she scared about? And we, we tend not to do that as family members um, because we think we're protecting that, that, can, you know, that person with cancer. And so a person with cancer feels isolated in that sense from their family. Even though the family is the most supportive family, they can feel isolated. So talking to someone else who's had cancer, who's gone through that journey, who intuitively understands where the challenges are, you know, where, where the fears are, um, makes a huge difference in terms of treatment and in terms of the mental health of a, of a patient. Yeah, well, I've, okay. I've, met your, I've met your cancer survivors over the years in the events that I came and they are wonderful, wonderful human beings. I'm just going to say that. No? Right. Um, Doctor, I'm sorry, but can I go back to where you said that um, the health literacy rate in Malaysia is still very low, which is quite surprising to me because I thought, you know, with the advancement of the technology, people can easily access to a lot of things and information, but sadly, it's still low. How do you see this? Um, I mean, NCSM, you know, and maybe other NGOs helping to increase the, self, uh, the health literacy rate in Malaysia and how can this help tremendously in preventing 
preventing cancer. Any successful stories? And is there a pattern? I mean, sometimes we see that the B40 is left out, but is there such a thing as, you know, even the M40 is also left out with this information and health literacy rate in Malaysia? I think the, the issue that we have is um, we don't teach health education from a young age in Malaysia. So health education is, is not something which is um, put front and center within our education um, curriculum for teenagers. Um, and so we go through life not understanding the importance of health. And it's only, um, typically it's only once you're retired and you're sitting there thinking, oh, you know, when I'm growing old, I don't want to get sick. And that's when we start thinking about our health. And as I mentioned before, it's too late. So yes, um, for NCSM and, and other NGOs, what we're really trying to do is to get boots on the ground, really. Um, because yes, there's a lot of information out there, um, but a lot of that information now is as, as we are today, you know, is on the internet, it's on social media, and you have to access it. And there's so much information out there. It's very difficult to know what to access. Um, and unfortunately in, um, in today's world, people don't have a lot of time. You know, people don't want to spend a lot of time accessing information. Um, so we're still finding that, yes, um, we, we need to utilize the platforms which are out there a lot better. Um, so thank you very much for having us on, on this. Um, but, you know, we have to utilize, you know, social media. Uh, we have to be able to get short, crisp messages out there which um, resonate with people. And, and that's something I, I think NGOs are not very good at. Um, that's where we need, you know, people who are in advertising, who are in comms, et cetera, who understand how to get those crisp messages out there, which, you know, people can catch on to and, and, and um, absorb um, and do a, you know, make sure that it be becomes a behavior change. Because one thing is actually taking in the information, um, absorbing it, and then the next day, you know, you're eating another bowl of ice cream, you know, but um, it's, it's, you know, that's me, that's me, you know, I've, I've, if Ben knows me, I've, I've um, struggled with my weight all my life. It's been up and down, up and down, up and down. And, um, and I know the health risks in terms of being overweight or, you know, being obese. I know all the health risks, but it's still very hard to say no to that bowl of ice cream. And, um, and I think that's all of us. All of us, we need to um, be a little bit more focused in terms of our health. Um, as NGOs, we need to understand what the, the behavioral patterns of people are out there. So there's a lot more research which needs to be done on why people um, don't want to take these health messages, why people are, are not listening um, to, to us. Um, and, you know, the Ministry of Health, etc. And so we can change that behavior, as, as Hannah, you mentioned, you know, why are we coming so late to, to hospitals? Um, we need to, to find ways to change that behavior. And um, hopefully, you know, we, we, we are having inroads, definitely, I think, um, compared to 20 years ago when I first started, where, you know, when we had a booth on, on cancer in a shopping mall, People would walk towards us because we had bright yellow colors, et cetera, et cetera. And then when they found out it was cancer, you could see them swerving into the other direction because, you know, nobody wanted to come see us. Um, now you're getting more and more people coming to see us. Um, so, yes, I think we are breaking that stigma. We're, we're opening up the conversations, but we have to do a lot more of it. Let's just talk about what you said just now, Dr. Sound, ice cream. Okay, like, ice cream makes us smile all the time. Okay, but you know what? I mean, and it's it's really funny that you say nobody is listening, and your name is Doctor Sound. <laughs> okay, but I need to be able to learn how to sing, then I can say you know Sound of Music. But I cannot hey, sing. Don't sing, ask me to sing. <laughs> sing, sing. Singing always helps with the messaging that the communication people. And it's really funny that because I say about ice cream, I say about sound because. AccuAnswer, our sponsor, is all about helping people measure their glucose levels so they don't, so they can 
prevent themselves from becoming diabetic, which is also part of the equation of cancer. Because I look at yes. three things, I look at three things, or we look at three things when we look at uh, you know diseases like diabetes and cancer. It's all about stress, diet, and choices. The choices that you make. Are you an ambitious person or not? If you're not an ambitious person, you're probably not going to get much stress in your life, which is a good thing. But if you are an ambitious person, you get stress. And there's a high chance that this could trigger some cancer cells. So maybe you can, uh, the, the, the question that I have here is, what, in, in very simple coffee shop English, what causes cancer? I mean, from the medical and non-medical perspective. This is just to, in simple terms to get it out to everybody out there because like you said people are not aware they take it for granted oh i'm young i don't need to go through a screening or i'm young i don't need to eat well or i'm young i don't need to do a b c and d but they do yep okay so basically all cancer is is an overgrowth of cells now um when we're born you know we our whole body is made up of cells but those cells keep on regenerating so it's you know we're like a tree you know you have a tree you've got the main you've got the main um, trunk and then you've got the leaves the leaves die and new leaves come about you know flowers come about etc and that's that's the cycle and it's the same as our body our cells continue regenerating now with that regeneration of cells though um, when we are exposed to different what we call carcinogens carcinogens are things that can cause cancer. So when our cells are exposed to these things which can cause cancer, and you know the easiest thing for me to say is tobacco, because everybody links tobacco with cancer. So you know when you smoke, um, you inhale all these carcinogens, they get into your system, and when your cells regenerate, um, these carcinogens cause changes to those cells, and that's what triggers cancer to happen. And as I mentioned, you know, it takes years and years. The more you're exposed, the longer you're exposed, the higher the, the amount you're exposed to, the more frequent those cell changes are going to happen until finally you get this lump, which is called cancer. Okay. Um, so it, that's, the, the, you know, the most simplified way I can, I can describe it. Um, and then cancer, you know, it, back to your analogy of, of a tree is that, Cancer is something which is alien, which burrows into your tree. So it's like termites. If you have termites in your tree, it will slowly attack that tree and overtake that tree and finally kill that tree. And that's what cancer does. So, you know, um, as I mentioned, carcinogens, um, tobacco is the number one. But, you know, Ben, from when I first started 20 years ago, when we just push this whole idea of tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. We now know that obesity, next to tobacco, obesity is the second biggest cause of cancer. Mm. Yeah. Diabetes, 20 years ago, I wouldn't be sitting here saying that, oh, you know, diabetes is linked to cancer. Now we know diabetes is linked to cancer. Yeah. One in five Malaysian adults are diabetic. That's 20% of our population, adult population, are diabetic. So, diabetic, you know, diabetes is just not linked to, oh, yes, you know, heart disease or, or you know, high blood sugar. And it, it's, it's, you know, people think of amputations and kidney disease and all. It is linked to cancer. The more alarming fact for me is that when I talk about obesity, again, one in two Malaysians, adult Malaysians, are obese or overweight yeah. you know so that's, that's alarming we are one of the most obese nations in the world but the most alarming thing here is that our children mm. one in five children are overweight or obese you know and that's increasing and and that means our next generation of of is going to have higher incidences of cancer than we do today. And we already find cancer to be so alarming in terms of numbers now. Can you imagine in 20 years time, our cancer numbers are going to be doubled. And it's not because of things that we cannot do anything about. These are things that we are doing to ourselves. Um, 
and you know it's it's that pleasure and pain sort of thing you know looking at that bowl of ice cream do i want to eat that bowl of ice cream um yes i do want to eat that bowl of ice cream am i going to think about 20 years down the line will that bowl of ice cream cause me cancer of course that doesn't go through my mind you know when you look at that that bowl of ice cream so it's choices that we make um and those choices we need to make we need to have that that strength of character i suppose um to to make those choices at a younger age than we are now yeah uh, definitely no yeah because i i think we are not uh giving options and choices better better and healthy choices to our kids even i mean let's look at the the way the pattern of the, the pattern of eating for our younger generation i mean every time there's always a boba on their hand or there's always a cup of i don't know um uh, caramel uh, sugar or something drinks on their hand all the time and it's something that it's trendy to them and to them drink, drinking something that is sugary eating something that's sugary is something that is cool so we're not actually inculcating a good culture or eating habit uh, for our children let's face it <laughs> we are to blame because because the the issue that we have i think is that we we have built this whole idea of um of pleasures that you know um that giving them a piece of cake um is a reward going out for dinner in a restaurant is hey you know let's go and do it because it's a reward or it's something pleasurable that we can do as a family um we so so we've we've got that you know that whole idea that you know these things are, are things to look forward to um you know you say that Hannah that we're not in educating our children about it and i think the other factor is that when our children want to make those good decisions mm-hmm. we're not encouraging it either and we're actually oh. discouraging it to a certain extent you know like my daughter um decided to become a vegetarian right. and so my and i you know sc- scratched our heads and you know the first thing we thought is <laughs> Oh gosh. Now we have to try to cook vegetarian food in this house. You know, it it it's it's just a nightmare thinking, you know, we want to eat meat, and someone else wants to eat vegetables. How do we make sure that, you know, she eats the right vegetables, etc., etc., etc. So, you know, in in that manner, in a way we discouraged it. Um, but mm-hmm. she stayed firm, you know, she's become vegetarian. Um, initially she was eating eggs. So I used to just throw, you know, four eggs at her every day sort of thing. Um, <laughs> now she doesn't want to eat eggs. so it's like okay um but yeah you know and she's in college and we worry that she's not eating well because you know if you're on a vegetarian diet you feel that you have to eat more because if not you feel hungry or you're not getting enough protein etc so we in ourselves in in trying to protect our child we actually pushing her more towards bad habits of you know eating energy bars or you know you know taking things which might be higher of sugar to give her the energy because we're afraid that you know she's not eating enough of of the good stuff so i think we don't realize we're doing it mm-hmm. um to our children because we're we're not focused on that okay you know um that idea of healthy eating we're just focused on trying to keep i don't know whether it's to keep our children safe or to keep our children um i wouldn't say healthy but yeah it to keep our children happy and happy in our minds doesn't always equate to healthy mm exactly no well said well said yeah yeah well said but um i'm just going to ask some and you know we, we obviously NCSM work very very hard you know behind the scenes you know we just see with when you sit in the shopping malls and what not but tell us, i mean and there's there's a bit of an expectation of what NCSM can do or should do and you've spoken about those expectations those three pillars that you spoke about but i mean in my opinion you all have done quite a good job despite you know, all the obstacles and hurdles out there especially with covid you know But tell us about if we want to keep it quite positive tell us about the wins that you know, the National Cancer Society of Malaysia are very proud of 
you know, the work that you've done, the wins that you've got to make, you know, the quest and the journey for the cure for cancer, maybe that much shorter? I think, you know, a, a win for me at NCSM is having someone walk through our door um, very scared, um, most, you know, nearly in tears and will break down in tears, et cetera, et cetera, but who's able to walk out of our doors um, with at least a smile or at least some hope in their in their heart and knowing that they are not alone in their journey. And, you know, I know people think, oh, you know, that that's, that's a little bit of feel good factor, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not, it's just not the feel good factor of it because what it is really is knowing then that this person who walked in the door, not sure whether or not um, that they wanted treatment for cancer because they thought that they were going to die from cancer anyway. Um, this person has decided, yes, that I'm willing to go through the treatment. This person has realized that I have not lost my identity to cancer. I am still a person. I am still um, someone who has a place in life and society and is willing to fight um, to keep that place um, and an identity, um, which means that person isn't gonna go home and just um, not get treated or go home and go down the path of taking alternative treatments um, and dying a slow, painful death of cancer, you know, when, when the cancer becomes worse. Um, and we have kept this person I think in a way safe. Um, and this person has found a, a new a new norm. I know I know this whole thing of you know having a new norm after COVID, but you know, but yes, there is a new norm after cancer as well. Um, mm. and it is wonderful when you speak to cancer survivors and, and they talk to you and they say that I'm actually a better person after my cancer diagnosis than before my cancer diagnosis. Oh. Oh, that's, that, that's a massive win. Wow. That, that, yes, exactly. I, I think that to me is, is the massive win. And it's it, the massive win as well is to see the cancer survivors themselves so empowered that, you know, NCSM is, is, is just there in the background as a platform for them to go out and do things, to, to embrace others and to empower others to take that journey. Um, and, and, and that's the wonderful thing about being with NCSM. And that's something which I'm so proud of because you know when I started, as I said, 20 years ago, um, we didn't have people with cancer walking through our doors because they were just so sad, because there was so much stigma associated with it. Now we have people who will proudly walk through our doors and announce that they are cancer survivors. And people didn't do that 20 years ago. Um, you know, the, the Indians talk about, or the Hindus talk about third eye, you know, when you when you, when you you talk about yourself too much, et cetera, et cetera, it, it's bringing that light onto your eye, you know, onto you and bad things will happen. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people with cancer felt that way, that if you, if you talked about your win, if you talk that yes, you know, I beat cancer and I, I know I got through it, it was like asking the cancer to come back and have a second chance at you. Um, that's how a lot of people with cancer felt those days. Now they don't, um, and and that is an amazing win, I think. Well, now I've got well now I've got three more questions to ask Dr. Sam, but I'm going to roll it into one. So basically, I want you to question to ask, and thank you. Like, I mean, again, I mean, it's really funny that we talk about the connection of diabetes and, you know, cancer and dietary looking after ourselves and, you know, your answer, our sponsor is helping people look after themselves. So thank you. Anna, and thank you, NCSM. It's, you know, just our world, our world's coming together. So it's so great to spread the message of health and health is wealth. 
you know, I, I, I'm a well film, well film yeah. believer in that. All three of us. I, I mean, I, I very much know that from my friendship with Dr. Sound. But now, do you have any more questions before I ask Dr. Sound with that big chunky question? <laughs> uh, no. Because uh, one of part of that question, I'm going to get encourage people to open their wallets to donate to NCSM. So now, take it away. Yeah, Dr. Sound, we are two months shy from 2022. What are the plans uh, moving forward for NCSM to create more awareness, to help and support cancer patients um, in Belize and really? The dogs are yeah. screaming out loud, Dr. Sound. Yeah. They, they are telling everybody out there. Where's our oh, help, help NCSM. <laughs> okay, I, I think, you know, we are looking so forward and we're crossing fingers like crazy is that we can go back to the work that we really want to do. And that is to be to be able to be on the ground, um, creating health promotion or creating cancer awareness. Um, since July, we've had a joke at the National Cancer Society of Malaysia that we are the National COVID Society of Malaysia because we have just been going out there doing vaccinations. The National Cancer Society, because you know we couldn't get to our cancer patients and a lot of cancer patients were afraid to go into into the big PPVs to do their vaccinations, etc. So we decided to go to their homes and do vaccinations. And along the way, we just vaccinated anybody who couldn't um, come out to be vaccinated. So we did a home vaccination program. And we're so proud to be able to say, you know, we did um, over 100,000 vaccinations at home around Malaysia. Um, cancer patients and you know heart stroke etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's it's a, it's a wonderful feeling but really we want to go back on the ground and so next year is is that full focus on getting back onto the ground increasing that health promotion getting people to get back and, and gain confidence into going back into the clinics into going back into the hospitals because unfortunately we are Cancer has moved back um, at least one year, two years because of COVID, because so many people didn't get themselves into hospitals. People who could have been diagnosed at stage one or stage two have been diagnosed at stage three, stage four, because they were so fearful about going into hospitals. And to be honest, you know, many hospitals couldn't provide the services that they should have um, in terms of cancer. So we've, we've, we've fallen back in that sense, and we need to, to accelerate that. We need to accelerate that idea irrespective of what is out there, whether it be COVID, whether it be another infective disease, et cetera, et cetera. Cancer does not stop marching, and neither should we. You know, we still need to get into the clinics, get into the hospitals, get treated. But to get to that point, you need to understand what are your risk factors. You need, everyone needs to look at themselves, whatever age you are, look at your family history, whether you've got cancer in your family, look at, um, look at what your own personal risk factors are, whether like, like me, you know, I like eating. Um, so yes, I'm overweight. <laughs> Whether, you know, I hate exercising. My husband's an exercise freak. I look at him and I run the other direction and that would be the most running I would do. You know, I, I, just, I just find it very difficult to, to exercise and that's something that I should do. So, you know, I have to look at the risk factors that I have. Um, and so all of us have to and, and assess what is our risk for cancer. What can we change in that risk profile? And okay, fine, you don't have to change everything overnight, but small steps become big steps, you know, along the way. If you start small, don't be so incredibly ambitious and say, I'm going to stop eating ice cream for the rest of my life, because you know it's never going to happen. <laughs> um, but say, okay, you know, we only eat ice cream once a week instead of, yeah, you know, once every day. More realistic. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so be realistic about those goals. But you know, as as those goals, in, as as we um, as we get through those goals, um, it will make a difference in terms of our, our long term risk factors in cancer. And um, yes, so NCSM next year is pushing back into that health promotion aspect um, and and trying to elevate the Malaysian population 
in terms of being more proactive about their health. So the just final question that we have for you, Dr. Sun, it's been a very sound interview, no pun intended, but <laughs> what's this, I mean, Dogs as well, this background. Yeah, <laughs> no, but you made it. You made something uh, sound so. Uh, this topic very sounds very simple, and that's that. That was the message that we wanted to get across to our viewers out there, just so other people can look after themselves. And that's what our sponsor AccuAnswer is all about as well. But in terms of, you uh, know, in the, in terms of the long term, I mean, what you want to do is dictated by funding. Okay, and funding is the hardest job in the world. I mean, if you ask anybody, I'm sure your business development manager or managers of the past have gone crazy knocking on doors and asking for money. Okay, but tell us yeah. about the funding aspect. How much, do you, in, a, in a perfect world, if you were to rub the, the genie lamp and you were to say to the genie, look, genie, I need this much to do that much. I mean, the first wish would be get rid of cancer. But, you know, I mean, maybe we don't live in that world yet. Okay, but if you were to rub that genie and say, look, I need this much money to do this much, how much fun, I mean, how much funding would you need to do, to do, and what would it be needed for? And how can our viewers of Great People TV watching this episode, not just live, but in a replay, help in terms of that funding course? So thank you, Ben, for that question. Um, yes, National Health Society doesn't um, live on fresh air alone. Um, we, <laughs> we, we, wish. <laughs> we wish, but um, and we don't just live on volunteers. I think a lot of people think that NGOs, oh, it's volunteers. So, you know, you don't have to pay people per se. Many of our staff are specialized staff. So, you know, we have over 50 staff members. Um, and the programs that we do means that, you know, if we have to go out on the ground, et cetera, et cetera, that does cost money. So we are completely public funded. So every, every single cent, I keep saying, you know, every single cent, whether you want to give 50 cents, you want to give a ringgit, 10 ringgit, 100 ringgit, thousands, millions, <laughs> um, it, 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 it comes in handy. I just signed a check today. Well, I just signed a, an agreement today to spend two million on a machine, and it's a machine. It's a diagnostic machine um, for for cancer, and it's a machine that we use at our center, and it's um, it's a subsidized cost to people, and for a lot of people, we do it free of charge. Um, but at the end of the day, we still have to pay for the machine, even though the services are free of charge. So the National Cancer Society spends, you know, up. To about 15 million um, every year in terms of the services we could double that amount of money um, and to expand our services because you know like many ngos we are predominantly in the Klang valley or you know malacca or the big cities to be able to go into the smaller communities into the kampongs into um, the smaller states um, it takes money, unfortunately. It takes resources, um, it takes people, and it takes money. So, you know, I, I can't sit here and say, you know, you know, please give me 50 million. Um, yes, I would love 50 million. But to anybody out there who, you know, who feels a little bit for the National Cancer Society, um, if you give with your heart, we accept it, you know, with, with love in our heart in that sense because every little bit counts if every single malaysian gave one ringgit that would be 30 million yeah so yeah. so we're not asking huge amounts of money um in that sense you know we're asking yes um for more people to to invest in cancer and i say it as invest um and a lot of people don't economically, people think that cancer or health is a cost. It is not a cost. It is an investment. It is an investment into your future and into the future generations as well. You know, and, and you have to look at it that way. Cancer is not sexy. I can't make it sexy. You know, um, But the more money and the more resources, effective resources that we put into health education, teaching our young, um, on on healthy lifestyles, on behavior changes, etc. We are investing into their future. 
just as you invest your money into the education, into the you know, into university, you put your money aside for all that. Put some money aside to invest into their health as well. Well, that's very well said, Dr. San, and I'm going to speak on behalf of me and Hannah right here. I mean, I was invited to all your events over the years. And I had a ball of the time. You've been a wonderful supporter. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm, I mean, and I, I made some good friends there. Your cancer patients and cancer survivors are wonderful people. Your support staff are wonderful people. You're a wonderful person. You've done a great job. I'm just going to say this right now, and I'm not saying it for the sake of saying it. You know I can back it up, Dr. Sound, but I mean, Great People TV, we're a startup. We don't have, I mean, we've got a couple of ringgits to give, which we will give a couple of ringgit, but, you know, we don't have a lot of money yet, but Great People TV would like to sponsor NCSM in terms of if you guys have any events and you need our services as MCs, you know, Hannah's the best Malay MC in the land. I'm going to offend Aww. a lot of, I'm, I'm going to offend a lot of Malay actors and <laughs> by saying that, but I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Think about NCSM first. So, but Hannah, seriously, Hannah's the best Malay MC there is out there. I'm not bad at English MC, as you can see. So we'd be more than happy to sponsor you. No cost involved because it helped because we know those events, like an MOU event helps bring formally and in friendship wise, those relationships yep. and it can help monetize something that can buy those machines worth two million, four million, six million. Yeah. So great people TV will always officially or unofficially be behind you in terms of that support. Okay. So yeah. thank you. We will definitely hold you to that. <laughs> I know you will. So <laughs> you've you always been there for us, man. But Hannah, Hannah, you've been you've been, you know, cool into the family now, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a new recruit. I'm a new recruit. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, what I was telling you offline, I, I do I, I do apologize for going off radar. I mean, I, I was working with you for a number of events uh, from 24, 2012 to 2016. I, I'm not 2017, but I do apologize for going off radar 2018 onwards because it was just, uh, for, for me, it was a tough time then because of, you know, some financial challenges and whatnot. But I know you all are my friends and you picked up the phone no problem when I, when I called. You said you, you never hesitated for this interview and we really appreciate that. That, that that's friendship yep no but thank you for having me um no as no i said you know you, you put great team great people there and it, it, it scared me to a certain extent uh, <laughs> but no you've you've made this wonderful and um we'd be very very happy to 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 come back and do th more things to yep. educate yep. and to um help people do better that's right. that's right well dr san you take care uh now any last me um, messages or words to Dr. San. It's been a very nice interview. So, I mean, it's not, it doesn't feel like an yes. interview, like a discussion. Yeah. Actually, I learned a lot about NCSM and what are the things that they do to help and support uh, Malaysians and those suffer suffering from cancer and even for cancer uh, and their families and their families as well. Because, you know, like I said, I've had a few of my family members who've actually, uh, who lost their life due to cancer. And sadly, most of them are, uh, discovered at the end of the stage. So, yeah, hopefully uh, in this session, it will create more awareness, not to just not towards my family members as well, but to all uh, those who are watching Great People TV. So thank you so much, Dr. Sound. It, it really means a lot to me. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Sound. Keep up the good work, yeah, and please give, my, give our love and warm hugs and fist pumps to everybody at NCSM. They're wonderful. I will, and your yeah. puppy as well. Yeah, and your puppies. <laughs> yes. Yes, you were lucky. They're hungry. You didn't get the cats. You didn't get the cats. The cats were roaming as well. So. Well, they were probably stirring up the dogs because everybody's hungry. So you got some people to feed, oh, some animals to feed after this. They're people as well. I suppose. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dr. San. We really appreciate it. Thank you, it. Dr. Yeah. San. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Bye. Oh, that oh, was, and there that was, we have it. That was nice. No, that was really inspirational. Yeah. Very educational, yes. very informal, yeah. but formal at the same time. What do you think? Betul, betul. Uh, dan saya sangat-sangat setuju dengan apa yang dikatakan Dr. Sang sebentar tadi dan sama-sama kita support sebenarnya NCSM dalam usaha mereka untuk memberikan lebih banyak kesedaran dan juga support kepada uh, penyakit kanser dekat luar sana. Okay, and with that, kita dah sampai ke segmen yang mana ramai yang tunggu-tunggu, segmen di mana anda boleh memenangi barangan daripada IQ Answer. Mungkin Ben ada soalan cepu cemas nak diberikan kepada anda untuk anda menang hadiah daripada IQ Answer, Ben. Okay, 
That's right, a very, very simple question, a very simple quiz question. All you've got to do is look at the question right now and then mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, it's a simple yes or no answer. Are you at risk of getting uh, cancer? Risk of getting cancer if you have obesity, diabetes, or high cholesterol? Or high cholesterol. Okay, so mm -hmm. yes or no, you can just pump in the answer on the comments field right there, and then we will be in touch with you in terms of, you know, your address, your, your contact number, and we will give you away the prize. So that. Yep. Uh, we'll just repeat the question one more time. Are you at risk of getting cancer if you have obesity, diabetes, or high cholesterol? Yes or no? Hana, you want to translate that in BM? Betul. Adakah anda berisiko untuk mendapatkan kanser sekiranya anda ada penyakit obesity, diabetes dan juga uh, kolesterol yang tinggi? Uh, kadar kolesterol yang tinggi. Adakah anda berisiko untuk mendapatkan kanser Sekiranya anda uh, ada obesiti, diabetes ataupun kadar kolesterol yang tinggi Tuliskan jawapan anda sekarang dan kami akan pilih pemenangnya Dan pemenang akan layak mendapatkan barangan daripada AQ Answer That's right, so yeah. and finally before we wrap it up for tonight It's been a great episode Don't forget please, uh, our sponsor AQ Answer Trying to make the world, I mean people's lives a better place with the device or measuring the glucose please go to the AccuAnswer social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Shopee. Just click follow. And then all, after that, you can leave a comment on the respective social media platforms. And then you've got to tag three friends, digger friends, yeah, toi, as they say in French, and like three friends. And then random winners will be selected every month. You, I mean, if you do this, you stand a chance to win a cash voucher. How good is that now? Ya, yeah. sangat-sangat berbaloi ya. Okey, terima kasih kepada anda kerana mengikuti kami di Great People TV. Jangan lupa kita jumpa lagi minggu depan sebab kita ada satu lagi guest yang sangat-sangat menarik. Jadi pastikan anda bersama kami setiap minggu di Great People TV. Okey? Have a great night everyone. Take care and thanks for watching.